Hello and welcome back to Church History. You'll notice that I've got a different shirt on this week. My wife said you better change your shirt because uh, <laughs> people think you've only got the one. But I actually have got more than one uh, shirt. Anyway, leaving shirts aside, uh, so far I've attempted an overview of the, say, the first 300 years of church history. I'm trying to paint a big picture without going into too much detail because if you go into too much detail, particularly when people don't understand, uh, when people are new to a to a topic, it can it can be very um, boring or confusing. Uh, so I'm trying to give you an overview of about the first 300 years, and we ended up uh, last time uh, with the, the persecutions that the church was facing, and I said that this time we'd be talking uh, about. Uh, uh, why it was that the persecutions stop. Uh, I've decided to, to change it uh, and do that next week. Because what I thought we'd do is go back, rewind a bit, go back to 70 AD uh, and have a look at a topic uh, known as the destruction of Jerusalem. Why is this worthy of uh, a video all of its own? Well, because it really uh, shaped the, the, the future direction and the nature of the church. Uh, and uh, it was not only a, a devastating event, uh, but it also shows us uh, that the Bible is an inspired book because uh, this event was prophesied uh, in the Old Testament and by the Lord Jesus. Uh, we, and uh, his, his uh, prophecies are recorded uh, in, in the Gospels. So I thought we'd have a look at that. We'd get a bit of detail. Uh, so let's have a look then. At the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, as I was just saying, the, the Bible is an absolutely amazing book. And one of the chief reasons it's amazing is because it is able to predict the future with unerring accuracy. Uh, imagine you had the ability to predict the future. Uh, you could make a, a vast amount <laughs> of money out of it, uh, I, I should imagine. Uh, but uh, People dismiss the Bible. They say, oh, it's a load of myths, a load of fairy tales. If people only knew the amount of prophecies there were, the amount of predictions about things were going to take place in the future, uh, whether it be the rise and fall of, of nations, the rise and fall of cities, the rise and fall of, of whole civilizations, uh, the, the rise and fall of individuals uh, who are going to be prominent in history. If people only knew, then they would never speak in that disrespectful way about the Bible. And, and, and of course, if you've got a book that is able to predict the future, what does that say about its authorship? No human being could do that. That book has been written by someone who not only knows the future, but someone who controls the future. This book here, from cover to cover, is written by God. That's, that's one of the things that makes the Bible so uh, amazing. The predictions of the Bible cover many things, but oh, perhaps the most wonderful thing the Bible predicts is the coming of the Lord Jesus, the coming of the Messiah. And it's we'll say more about this uh, this in this uh, in this talk. Uh, but uh, the the Bible, the, the Old Testament tells us that the Messiah is coming, and it tells us how to identify the Messiah. It says you look at the ministry of the of the, of the Messiah. You look at uh, the place where he was supposed to be born. You look at the way he died. All this will tell you who he is when he comes. Uh, and so no Jew who knew uh, their Bible should have had any doubt whatsoever when the Lord Jesus turned up uh, that uh, he was uh, someone who, uh, at the very least, was a, was a serious candidate uh, to be Messiah. Uh, he should not have been treated like he was, certainly he shouldn't have been put to death by them. So the Bible is, 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 gives a phenomenal amount of detail uh, about uh, the, the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Lord Jesus. But there's another subject which the, the, the scriptures uh, talk about, and that's the, the, the future of Jerusalem. It it's, describes uh, its, its risings and its, and its, and its falls. Uh, and occasional judgments to, to fall on it. Uh, and one of the major aspects of uh, the history of Jerusalem recorded in the Bible is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The Roman armies came, surrounded it, 
not, not only did they uh, destroy the, the walls when they got through into Jerusalem, they even burned down uh, and, uh, the, the, the temple and then leave one stone standing upon uh, another. Uh, and the, uh, the, the life of the Lord Jesus and the destruction of Jerusalem, these two are, are, are knitted together in a, a Bible prophecy and uh, in church history. So let's have a look at this subject. Uh, where does the Old Testament mention the destruction of Jerusalem uh, in 70 AD? Well, if you've got a Bible, uh, turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. And let me read from verses 25 to 26. There's an angel speaking to Daniel here. Daniel is one of the four young men. It's Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego who had been taken from Jerusalem. Uh, and exiled in Babylon, and a number, uh, along with uh, uh, th hundreds of thousands of other uh, Jews, uh, and the nation itself, and Jerusalem in particular, uh, was was invaded by the Babylonians and uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the king, uh, as a as a punishment because of their wickedness and idolatry. These were God's covenant people, but they turned their back on God. They turned their back on the covenant, and the Lord said, "You will not do this and get away with it." And they were going to be sent to Babylon to, to, to have this idolatry burned out of them for, uh, as Jeremiah the prophet uh, prophesied, for 70 years. Now there is Daniel sitting in his study. He's, uh, he went to, to, to Babylon as a boy, probably a boy of 14. Now he's, he's, he's probably about 80 and he's reading through Jeremiah. I don't know how often you read through the book of Jeremiah. Uh, but he's, he's reading and it comes to the part where he reads that the Jews only have to stay in Babylon for 70 years. So beginning in chapter 9, he begins to pray that the people of Israel be allowed to go home. His, uh, his prayer is answered by an angel that comes down and informs Daniel, yes, you will be allowed to go home. Uh, but he says, it's not all going to be good news. Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt again. Normal life will continue but there's going to be another 70 years in the history of Jerusalem uh, it's well, not so much 70 years it's 70 times seven years uh, for, uh, within 490 years all kinds of things are going to happen to Jerusalem and at the end of the period that the angel warns about uh, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed again and Daniel is receiving this vision and this is what the angel says to him it says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commands to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, uh, this, the weeks of years. The, the street will be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the Prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end of it shall be with a flood. So Daniel's being told a number of things. You're going to be able to go home. The city is going to be rebuilt. And we know about what uh, about how that took place. Uh, because we have the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But Daniel's told towards the end of this period. The Messiah is going to come. And instead of being wonderfully and graciously received by the people of Israel. They're going to kill him. And as a punishment for this, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed again. And was it fair for God to punish Israel for not recognising the Messiah when it came? Uh, there were loads of people who claimed to be the Messiah. Um, like surely they could be forgiven for thinking that Jesus was possibly just another one of these claimants, uh, perhaps a, tr a troublemaker, an imposter. Well, as I said uh, earlier, they had no excuse not to recognise Jesus as the Messiah when he came. Because the signs of, uh, of who the Messiah would be were, were absolutely clear and all of them pointed to Jesus. What were these signs? Well, first of all, we haven't got time to look at uh, the passage now, but in Isaiah 35 verses 5 to 6, the scriptures I told the Jews, when the Messiah comes, he's going to do great miracles. He's going to open the eyes of the blind. 
he's going to make the, the, the deaf hear. He's going to make the lame walk. When the Messiah comes, he is going to do phenomenal miracles. And of course, what did the Lord Jesus do? He didn't, he, he didn't do just a few miracles, did he? He did miracles on an industrial scale. Uh, some Bible commentators have suggested that by the time Jesus was finished, uh, his ministry uh, on earth in those three and a half years, there was hardly anyone left for the uh, apostles to heal when they took up their ministry. That's how great Jesus' healing uh, uh, campaign was. So when the Messiah comes, he's got to be able to do great, notable miracles. Not only that, you'd be able to tell the Messiah because of his family tree. Uh, the, the, the scripture said you could tell the Messiah because, first of all, is going to be descended from Abraham. Now that works. That, that wipes out 99.9% .9 of everybody else in, in the world. Uh, the Messiah has got to be a descendant of Abraham. Now Abraham has uh, two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Uh, even though Ishmael is the oldest, the Messiah has got to come from the younger son, Isaac. And then Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. And again, the Messiah has got to come from the younger son's line, that is uh, Jacob. Not only that, Jacob has 12 sons, uh, 12 tribes of Israel, and the Messiah has got to come from one tribe in particular. Do you know what that tribe was? The tribe of Judah. It's got to be from the tribe of Judah. Now, the, the, the tribe of Judah is full of all kinds of clans and families, but the Messiah has got to come from one clan in particular. And uh, Isaiah again tells us this. He's got to come from the clan or the family of Jesse. Now Jesse himself has, has eight sons. The Messiah has got to come from the youngest son. Did you know the name of the youngest son? David. It's got to be David's descendant. That's why the Messiah is called son of David. Remember Bartimaeus sitting by the roadside begging when he hears Jesus of Nazareth. He's coming along who he thinks is the Messiah. He cries out, son of David, have mercy on me. Not only has he got to be descended from uh, David, he's also got to be born where David was born. He's got to be born in the little town of Bethlehem. And not only that, his early ministry has got to take place in Galilee. Now, if you're comparing these things with Jesus' life and ministry, you're just going tick, tick, tick all the time, all the way down. Uh, after Jesus uh, had, 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 had finished his, his healing and, and preaching work, obviously he was, he was crucified uh, by the Jews. But even that should have been an indication to them uh, subsequently that he was the Messiah. Because you read in Psalm 22 that the Messiah is going to die by having his hands and his feet pierced. And people are going to gamble for his clothes. Uh, also that he's going to be... Uh, He's going to die uh, in the company of criminals and buried in a rich man's tomb. Where do we read about that? Isaiah chapter 53. You've got prophecy after prophecy after prophecy on how you can identify the Messiah and the Lord Jesus fulfilled every single one. So what happened? Jesus comes. He, does, he performs his, his miracles and his preaching ministry for three and a half years and then we come to holy week the week before he's crucified on good friday which is the week in which uh, uh, i'm speaking to you now actually so it's quite fitting and in the week before uh, jesus is crucified he's in jerusalem with his disciples and he knows that the people there are plotting against him the religious leaders and that they they hate him and not only does he know that, he lets them know that he knows that. Uh, and so he tells them a couple of parables. And uh, let me turn you to them. Uh, Matthew chapter 21, verse 33. The parable of the vineyard. The Lord Jesus is speaking about uh, the, uh, the, the land of Israel as if it's a vineyard. And so it's using that kind of uh, imagery. And Jesus is speaking directly to the Pharisees. And, and, the, and the leaders and he says this here another parable there was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it dug a wine press in it and built a tower and he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country 
Now, when vintage time drew near, it was harvest time for the grapes, uh, uh, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruits. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. And again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did likewise uh, to them. Uh, this is a reference to the Old Testament prophets who turned to, uh, who came to Israel, commanded them to, to repent, and rather than listening to these prophets, the, these prophets were executed. Again, uh, he sent other uh, servants more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them. Uh, Jesus is speaking about himself, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Here's Jesus predicting his, his own death. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? What will he do to the, the people of Jerusalem? And they said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruits in their season. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now, when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. You're going to kill me, says Jesus. I know you're going to kill me. But you're going to be punished for doing it. And then he goes on immediately you know, to Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. Uh, the, the parable of the, of the marriage feast, the wedding. And Jesus answered, and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Jesus was supposed to come and marry his bride, Israel. And sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants, saying, Tell those who were invited, See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed, and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious. And he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready. But those who were invited were not worthy. Now, any of the Jewish leaders who knew the book of Daniel, and that should have been all of them, would have known that Jesus was pointing back to Daniel chapter 9. And he's warning them, you kill me, you're killing the wrong person. You kill me, you're killing the Messiah. You kill me, Jerusalem is going to be finished, uh, visited with a terrible judgment. But it wasn't only the uh, uh, rulers that... Uh, Jesus warned. He also warned his own disciples that this was going to come. Because this destruction was going to come while many of them were still alive. And he warned his, uh, warned his disciples how they could avoid being caught up in this destruction in Jerusalem. So turn with me now to uh, Luke chapter 21. And first of all, reading uh, verses 5 to 7. There's the Lord Jesus. He's, uh, he's up on the Mount of Olives. Uh, having a look at the lovely view. And... The disciples are pointing out the, the, the temple, which was built by Herod, one of the seven wonders of the world, uh, and wondering what Jesus uh, was thinking about it. Uh, then, as some spoke of the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and donations, he said, Jesus said, These things which you see, the days will come in which not one stone shall be left upon another, 
that shall not be thrown down. So they asked him, saying, Teacher, but when will these things be? And what sign will there be that these things are about to take place? And Jesus gives a, a list of warnings uh, regarding the, uh, the coming destruction of Jerusalem. But if you look at chapter 21, verses 20 to 22, this is a specific warning that Jesus gives. This is like the final warning. Heed this one. Jesus says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So you're going to be alive, or many of you will be, or many of my disciples, many, many believers will be in Jerusalem. They'll be in Judea. When will this destruction take place? Well, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, whatever you do, don't go back into the city. Now, lots of people will would have thought that was a great idea because they had really, really thick walls. It was almost uh, impossible to besiege uh, if you had a decent army defending it. Uh, the, 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 there was enough food apparently in Jerusalem to last for about three years or so. So nobody would have needed to go hungry. And I suppose they thought, well, we're getting to Jerusalem. We'll, we'll, we'll lock the gates and we'll just wait for until the Romans get fed up and, and, and go home. Uh, but Jesus said, that is not what you are to do. When you see these armies come, you get out of the city, you get out of Judea as fast as you can. You get over the other side of the Jordan and you hide and you wait over there. That's what you've got to do. And that's in Holy Week. Just a few days after he gave these warnings, what happened to him? He's... He's betrayed by Judas, he's arrested, he goes through a series of mock trials, he's scourged, beaten, crucified. Then he rises from the dead and he ascends into heaven. What is next on God's agenda? Now, I don't know how you'd feel if someone killed your son and you were allowed to take vengeance on that person, how long you would wait to take vengeance? Do you know how long God waited to pour out his justice on those who killed Jesus? 37 years. And what happened in those 37 years? It was 37 years when the church was, was allowed to, to take the gospel, not just to the Gentiles, but specifically to the Jews. The, the, the practice was when you preach the gospel, you go to the Jew first and you plead with them to repent of what they've done to their Messiah. And when the Apostle Paul, you read in the book of Acts, when he used to, 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 to go to a, evangelize a new area, the first place he'd look for was a synagogue. And when he'd go into the synagogue, and what will he tell them? What was his sermon? That Jesus was the Messiah. And he proved it from the Old Testament scriptures, some of the scriptures that I've been uh, sharing with you. So, so there's a there's a, uh, a truce between God and, and, and Jerusalem for 37 years. In fact, Jerusalem is the capital of, of the church. The church headquarters is there. Now, there are many wonderful things about God. He's very, very gracious. He's very, very merciful. And he's patient. But his patience doesn't last forever. And the time came when the Lord was going to pay them back for what they'd done. And it was a time of a great feast. I think it was the, the Passover and people were gathered in. But uh, what had happened uh, leading up to 70 AD in uh, Israel? Well, there'd been a rebellion that had started in about 66 AD. The, if you know anything about the New Testament, you know that the... the People of Israel were not happy at all about having the Romans in their land. And there were always kind of mini uprisings that the Romans had to suppress. But in 66 AD, there was an uprising, and I believe it started in Galilee. It spread all over the country and it turned into a full scale war 
against the occupying Roman army. And the, 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 it was too great for the, uh, the, the Roman troops in Israel uh, to deal with. So they contacted the Caesar, and the Caesar uh, was Nero, told them that they were outnumbered. So what does Nero do? He sends his best general, General Vespasian, and Vespasian takes his son Titus, and they go to Jerusalem, well, they go, well, they go to Israel, with uh, things about four great legions, and they go to the centres of this rebellion in, in, in the regions around uh, on the outside of Jerusalem. And uh, they, they put down the rebellion in each one, brutally. One of the rebels uh, who uh, was, 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 was rebelling against Vespasian, he, he was captured. His name was Josephus, and he basically changed sides and decided uh, subsequently that he was going to write a, a, a history of what happened. So Josephus is an eyewitness of these events. And he says that uh, the, 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 having uh, knocked out all the other centres of resistance in the land, these great Roman legions now come and surround Jerusalem. Uh, but instead of attacking, they wait. They have to stop. Why? Because... In 68 AD, Nero died. In fact, he committed suicide. We won't go into that story now. And when a, a Caesar dies, you don't just carry on with a policy of that Caesar because the next Caesar might come in and have a com completely different view of what to do. So the, the, the soldiers are waiting. They're surrounding Jerusalem and they're not attacking. Now, in that period between uh, 68 and 70, there was tremendous confusion in Rome there were um, four men who tried to become Caesar in fact there were there were four uh, people who did become uh, Caesar but it didn't last very long some of it was just a matter of uh, months the, the fourth one and the most successful one the one who stayed Caesar for uh, many years was guess who General Vespasian and when he secured his position in 70 AD he decided that it was time for his sons to finish the work of destroying these rebels in Jerusalem. So the armies began to move on Jerusalem. So there was about 18 months when Jerusalem is surrounded by these Roman armies, where nothing is going on. What did unbelieving Jews do during that 18 months? They ran into the city of Jerusalem. What did believing Christians do? They did the exact opposite. They escaped while they could. And then after a, a, a siege of some months, finally, the, uh, there was a breach in, in, in one of the, the walls uh, of Jerusalem. Roman troops pour in. There's a massacre within the city. But the city had already begun to run out of food because there were different Jewish factions fighting against each other in the city. There was starvation. There was cannibalism. Uh, and added to this, when the Romans got in, they massacred uh, virtually everyone uh, that, that, that they found. Uh, not only that, they, they, they took prisoners and had them crucified along the roads in Judea. And the only reason they stopped the crucifixions was, was because they ran out of wood. The Romans were very angry with the Jews. But when they got into the city, they, they went to the temple and they saw the amount of gold that was there in the temple. And somebody started a fire in, in, in the temple. I don't know if it was done deliberately, uh, but it had the, uh, the effect of melting the gold in the walls of the temple. And so uh, as the gold melted, it went through the cracks uh, in, in the floor, went underneath the great stones of the temple. So do you know what the Romans did? They used their siege equipment to lift up these great, huge stones, turned them all uh, over so they could get the gold underneath and not one stone of the temple was left upon another isn't that amazing another half a million or so perhaps uh, sold into slavery somewhere between a million and two million of the inhabitants of Jerusalem either killed crucified or so sold into slavery this was God's punishment 
can eat his son. Now as we finish, just three lessons that we can draw from all this. And the first one is this. Well, what have we learned about the Bible? What have we learned about fulfilled prophecies? The Bible is no ordinary book, is it? It doesn't just predict in uh, the coming of the Messiah. It predicts the destruction of Jerusalem with an erring accuracy. The Bible is a book you can trust. You can not only trust its history, you can trust its theology. If you can trust the, if you can trust the Bible on history, you can trust it with your soul. Because this book is not written by men, although God used men. But it's written by the Spirit of God. Secondly, if the Bible was accurate about Jesus' first coming, don't you think it will be accurate about his second coming? When Jesus comes for the second time, he's not just coming to judge Jerusalem. He's coming to judge the whole earth. Not just Jews, but Jews and Gentiles. And all those who have turned their back on God will be judged. And on Judgment Day, world history will end and Jesus' throne will be set up. And everyone will be brought before his judgment throne and he will decide the eternal destiny of all mankind. Some we take taken to heaven those who have loved him and long for his appearing they'll go to heaven but others what does the bible say they'll be found in the lake of fire where they will be tormented day and night forever and ever oh you might be thinking oh surely these the, that, that's not going to happen is it surely that's just religious speculation isn't it no the book who told you that he was coming and and that he was going to destroy Jerusalem tells you that the second coming is equally as certain. Have you had your sins forgiven? Have you been reconciled to Jesus? Have you asked him to pour his mercy upon you? What's the third lesson? Would you see how merciful Jesus was? Do you see how merciful God was? There is Jesus and he's been murdered. And what is the heart of the Lord towards his people? It's one of mercy. You remember just before Jesus was crucified, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He, and he knew these people were planning to kill him. And what does he say? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, those of you who kill the prophets, and you stone all those preachers that are sent to you. I, this is not what I want. I don't want to have to come in judgment upon you. I would rather gather you up like a... A, a, a mother hen gathers her chickens and hold you tight to myself. That's what I want to do with you. I want to show you mercy, but you won't have mercy, will you? And he wept over Jerusalem. On the day of Pentecost, where the apostles were, where Apostle Peter was preaching, in, that, in, in his congregation on that day were thousands of people who had been there eight weeks before when Jesus was crucified. There were people in that crowd who had mocked Jesus. There were people in that crowd who had spat on him. There were the leaders of uh, the, 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 the betrayal, uh, the, the, the leaders among the Pharisees and the Sadducees uh, who, who had organised his, his, his murder and handed him over to Pilate. They were there. And what does Peter say? When people come to him, they're cut to the heart through his preaching. They say, men and, men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? What does Peter say? Repent. Seek the Lord's mercy. Be baptised. Come to him. And he will have mercy. You can imagine people coming out to Peter and saying, but, uh, but Peter, I, I, I laughed in his face as he, as he was carrying his cross down the road. Is there mercy for me? What, does, what would Peter have said to him? Yes, there's mercy even for you. <laughs> Oh, but but I slapped Jesus around the face. I spat at him as he walked by. I, I mocked him as he hung on the cross. Is, is it possible that there's mercy for me? What would Peter say? Yes, there's even mercy for you. And the Lord waited 37 years. He gave him 37 years to repent. 
And some of them did and some of them didn't. Now, those of you hearing me speak to you now, how long has the Lord been merciful to you? How long has he been waiting for you to come? You haven't come yet. You may say, oh, but he'd never have mercy on me. I've been far too wicked. I've been far too immoral. What would Peter say to you? He said, no, my friend. If you repent, you come to him and ask for mercy. There is mercy even for you. That's the message of the gospel. And that's the greatest lesson we learn from the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Thank you.